As we near the return of club football this week, and with the new year approaching, I thought it'd be a pretty good exercise to check in on all of the players out on loan for FC Barcelona. It's not usually something I do away from the podcast, because quite frankly, most of the loans away from FC Barcelona don't really work out. And due to the financial troubles of late, many of the loans that are ongoing are because of Barcelona not being able to pay wages and needing to get those wages off of the books so they could afford to even bring in new players and make sure that they're under that FFP cap. That is going to be a major theme throughout these loans, especially on the back end. But there are some players to highlight, certainly, that could, in theory, in the future, make an impact at FC Barcelona. I also found that this list was a reminder that going out on loan is not only not a certainty, but a lot of things can happen on their end, as in a new manager, a new president, a new change of regime, a new playing style, hot and cold spells that do change the fortunes of a player whose club now has them on loan, doesn't really need to see their future be too beneficial because they're not going to be reaping the rewards. That's why doing this loan watch at the end of December, beginning of January, while in terms of the footballing calendar kind of makes sense, loans usually don't bear fruit until the end of that loan. It does take the full year before a player can actually find his way into his new team. Sometimes it happens at the beginning for young players, but yeah, it takes a little bit of time, and that's why as much as I'm going to be talking about these loans, don't really give them the final grades until we're done at the end of the year. And as we jump right in, you'll understand why I added that last caveat there. Well, Catuso has been the man in charge of Valencia since Nico Gonzalez began his loan there over the summer. His full season loan should be judged in six months, more than right now, 14 games into the Liga campaign. Because let's start with the bad news. Nico Gonzalez has not become the starter that Kules might have thought he'd become, especially taking into account how depleted it looked like Valencia's squad was when he arrived. While he has made 12 appearances out of the possible 13, with the 14th match being against his parent club so he didn't feature, he's only started 36% of them and only played 41% of total minutes. He wasn't expected to add much end product, so maybe that one goal and 5% total goal participation is a consolation prize. That said, I'm not going to be all gloom and doom about Nico just yet, but it should make Kules, myself included, reconsider where and how his future at FC Barcelona may lie. He'll be 21 in a few days, so I'm not that worried that he still looks at times to be adjusting to top light football. But instead of putting his ceiling with the Pedris and Gobbies, two players he pretty much came into the first team with, it's probably safer to start viewing him as a depth player, but still a potential top 14 player on a good team, much like what Barca wanted from Frank Kessier this season. And this brings me to the second major point about Nico and what's still unknown about him. Valencia has a really intriguing midfield crop with all five of the regulars in a 4-3-3 formation being 22 or younger. Consistency is always a question with young players and all five are fighting for regular game time. And only three of the five are actually owned by Valencia. So it does make sense that Catuso would hope that Yunus Musa, who may be sold soon anyway, Hugo Guillamon, and Andre Almeida get every chance to take those starting spots over Nico and Iras Mariba who is on loan from RB Leipzig, but we're not opening up that can of worms today. And with that fivesome, Nico is basically one of the backup interiors and the backup pivot behind Guillemon. When Guillemon doesn't play or get the start, those are the times when we've seen Nico play there behind Musa and Almeida. When Nico plays alongside Guillemon, it's as an interior as I mentioned. And to be honest, much like the latter half of last season with Barca, I find that Nico neither excels or detracts as an interior. He works hard, moves the ball well, doesn't really break through the lines of passes or with runs, but his pressing instincts look to really fit into Gattuso's plan. In short, I'm not sure what we can take away just yet from Nico's loan outside of unfortunately saying that preseason, while I was really impressed with him at the pivot, should now be taken with a huge grain of salt. And maybe we do need to come to terms with the notion that at Barca, he probably isn't going to take the pivot spot for himself, but he can still be a really fine depth piece moving forward who can handle time across the midfield and likely be on wages that are cheaper than somebody else who would have to be brought in by FC Barcelona. All right, so obviously the biggest part of this review is about Nico, because I and many of you should probably think that he might have the biggest and brightest future at the club if anybody is able to return and make an impact. The other man who may return, but I'm not really so sure about that, is Ize Ade at Osasuna. He turned 21 just a few days ago, and it's a reminder that he wasn't really playing at a highly competitive level until last season. So I still think it's too early to say exactly what his ceiling is. Much like Nico, he's a part of the rotation in his lone club, but he's settled into a role as a player off the bench. He starts 36% of the time, as in three times of the eight games he's played in, and he's played 32% of the total minutes. In his defense, though, he was injured for the remaining three games of the first half, and then he went on to make three appearances for Morocco at the World Cup. And not only was the World Cup likely a great experience for him, but I did like the way that he was able to fit so well into Morocco's game plan. As we have discussed on podcasts before, it's a system, that be Morocco's, that requires everybody to do their jobs, especially positionally to the letter. 
And I think he both defended well and served as the release valve on the wing rather well in his brief appearances, including being a spark plug in the knockouts that each time almost led to something. For Osasuna though, there's still some ways to go, but I do like that he's fighting in a winning project and seems to have a role with the team fighting for a European spot. Osasuna is currently 7th, but just one point behind teams 4 through 6, meaning a Champions League spot. If Abde is sold this summer, I don't think Barca should sell for less than 15 million. His speed and dribbling prowess is elite, and even though the finishing isn't really there, that dribbling is a skill that should be valued at 15 million or more. If I had to rub my crystal ball, I'd say he gets sold in the summer with a very reasonable buyback. I know Barca could use a left winger, and that's why I find it almost as likely for the club to give him one more chance next season as they do trying to find a new home for him and try to get as much money as you can for a player that is very much still developing. I'd say that now we've talked about Nico and Abde, the other five were a bit easier and a bit quicker to go over. Well, maybe, maybe not. We'll let Sugino Dest decide. For those who follow the podcast, you can hear my more nuanced arguments about Dest's value. The right back market being shallow and his age, but I think even I can admit that his time at Barca is probably done. With his AC Milan loan and 20 million euro buy option, I said that there'd be two possible outcomes, and those are still very much in play. I said that he'd either play well and be bought for 20 million because the young fullback market is an overpriced wasteland, or he'd do poorly and would be too expensive for Barca to bring him back into the fold as a player likely worse and lower on confidence than when he left. But what might actually happen could be a bit of a mix of both. He's kind of stunk up the joint for AC Milan, played nine matches between Serie A and the Champions League while not nailing down the starting right back job. Contrary to those that are conflating it, he showed up on the right wing once or twice but has played most of his minutes at right back. He was poor in September in his first Serie A match against Napoli and he struggled a bit in the Champions League, but the rest has been fine. More interestingly, I and maybe others thought he was just above more than fine at the World Cup, at least looking like a 20 million euro player while playing for the US. Apparently Milan thought so too, and could use the World Cup showing to sign him permanently. But I will believe that that business gets done when I see that business get done. Moving to the Premier League, and Clement Lele is actually much more interesting alone than we first believed. A reminder that he is at Tottenham, who are said to be covering 80% of his wages, and with no option or obligation to buy. So for the 27 year old, it really is a prove it kind of deal. And you know what? Based on the last month of appearances and the mixed reviews coming from Tottenham fans, Lele seems to have proven something already, but not everything. He's played at both a back three and a back four, getting praised as a ball playing and creative left center back. Yeah, I know, weird when I hear that too, but he has been criticized in a back four for his questionable reactions. Now that's something we're familiar with. After taking some time to deal with an injury in August when he arrived, he started seven of the next 10 games, including the last five, and probably most importantly, the game against Brentford this week coming out of the break. Listen, if he can show himself as worth around 25 mil or so while auditioning for Tottenham around the Premier League, then this loan worked out. And so far, compared to everyone else we've mentioned, it's kind of wild to say that Langley's loan may have worked out the best. And as we keep going through this list, yeah, that's not really a compliment, but to have Langley exceed expectations, well, that's, I think, a good thing for Laporta, even more so than kool aids like you and I. Let's stick with the left-footed center backs and touch on Samuel Ntiti for a moment. The 29-year-old will never be back at Barca and will never have much market value, but he did take that pay reduction so that he could facilitate moves away to try to rehab his career. This season at Leche in Serie A, it has been a bit of a mixed bag for the Frenchman, but I will say that things started to look a bit more encouraging as the World Cup break neared. It took him until the middle of October for that fitness, but he finally got his first start and has since played four other matches in 333 minutes. At this point, I bring him up because yeah, he's on the list, but I want to add that as much as kool make him into this greedy villain for his Barca contract and World Cup choices, I just want to see the guy be able to play at a reasonable top flight level for a few more years. Speaking of playing in the top flight, Alex Callado has looked like a top flight player while playing for Elche, who don't necessarily look like a top flight side. His team stinks, quite frankly, and they rely on him quite a bit to create chances and help build what results in rather dull attacks. He has a goal and an assist this season, and that sounds pretty awful, but taking into consideration that Elche has only scored 11 total goals this season, and Callado has missed 6 matches of the 14 while dealing with some fitness stuff, one goal and one assist tells you how important he's been. The 23-year-old doesn't have a future at Barca, I think that's pretty clear by now, but his ability to play as a right winger or attacking midfielder give him enough versatility to be a useful creative impact sub for a Liga team for years to come. Now I think the only thing left to wonder is just how much he can help Elche fight out of the Spanish cellar for the next few months and where can he help another team maybe more permanently next season. Lastly, Francisco Trincao is 23 this week and his case is pretty interesting too. He's a regular starter for Sporting CP, who while being one of the big giants of Portugal historically, are not having their best season. Currently fourth in the table, but 12 points behind league leaders Benfica, who are running away with the competition. But you actually can't blame Trincao too much, 
who is now enjoying life back in Portugal. He's playing on the right wing, but the available space in Liga Portugal and the less than stellar defending with some of the teams farther down the table, well, Trincao is getting the space he needs to do his thing without having to worry so much about having his initial positioning be a problem. You could pretty much call him a forward, and he's kind of given this free roll up top depending on how he can try to either run with the ball or run in behind where that space is available. In his 24 appearances this season, he's returned 6 goals and 3 assists in over 1,700 minutes, so not too shabby of a return either. And remember, it's a 10 million euro obligation to buy, with Barca having a buyback for 3 years. So I didn't really need to add Trincao to this list, because technically he's not a Barca player anymore, but it is technically a loan, so I didn't want to give you the surprising good news about the Portuguese winger. And even with Trincao, 7 doesn't really feel like that many loans for all the players that exited over the summer. But do remember that all of Pjanic, Puj, Brathwaite, Wage, Minaj, Neto, Mgitha, and Dani Alves all left on frees of different sorts, with PK retiring and Coutinho and Aubameyang both signing for 20 million or less figures. Loans are never really that exciting either, but it should be another reminder that Cruyff and Alemani and Laporta and that whole crew, they have a lot more to think about than we always believe about just going and giving a call to the next big free agent or the next big signing that Barca should make. So wrapping this up, if you did enjoy this, Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Don't go too far because we have a La Masia update. That might be out in hours or at least in the next day. So keep an eye on that or keep watch of that if you will. And I hope you enjoyed this review of all the loans that Barcelona have currently going on. And if this is all you're going to watch, you don't watch the Academy stuff later in the week, that's fine too. I hope you have a happy holidays. And as always, Forza Barca.